MBK 1 32 Sage Dorvasa Chapter 32 Sage Dorvasa When Bhishma heard of the events at Dwight of Anna, he decided to speak to Doryodhan. Finding the prince seated with Shakuni in his majestic palace, Bhishma approached him and said, Oh child, I have repeatedly requested you not to maintain enmity with the Pandavas. You were advised not to go to the forest, but still you went. Now you have clearly seen the Pandavas' prowess, and also that of Karna. In your presence he fled the battlefield. It was then left to the Pandavas to rescue you. O king, in either martial skills, heroism or morality, Karna is not even a fourth of any one of Pandu's sons. Make peace with the brothers, for your good and for the good of our race. Bhishma knew that most of Duryodhan's hopes of defeating the Pandavas rested on Karna. Ever since Karna had appeared at the martial arts demonstration and challenged Arjuna, Duryodhan had seen him as the only way to conquer Arjuna. Now it should be obvious that Karna was no match for Arjuna. Bhishma looked hopefully at the prince, but Duryodhan, remembering the Danuva's words, laughed. What did this old man know? The Pandavas were in for a surprise. Bhishma himself would be a part of that surprise when the demons took hold of him. Duryodhan did not bother to reply. He stood up suddenly and walked out of the room. Bhishma could only shake his head sadly. He was not surprised to see Duryodhan's arrogance. It now seemed that the Koru's destruction was imminent. Bhishma returned slowly and sadly to his own chambers. After he left Bhishma, Duryodhan was joined by Karna, Shakuni, and Dashashana. The prince looked around at his counselors and asked, What remains to be done? How can I secure my good fortune? Let us fix on some plan, Doryodhan told them what Bhishma had said and Karna became uncomfortable. The Karu grandfather was always berating him. He did not seem to like him. Karna felt he was as much a well-wisher of the Korus as was Bhishma himself. Maybe it was time to prove Bhishma's assessment of him wrong. Wringing his hands he said, O mighty king, Bhishma blames us and praises the Pandavas. It is clear that he favors them over you. Because he bears you ill will, he abuses me too. I cannot bear to hear his words any longer. O king, give me an army and I shall single-handedly conquer the world for the Kauravas, just as the Pandavas did before the Rajasuya sacrifice. Let the wicked-minded wretch of the Kaurus, the senile Bhishma, see it and regret how he has treated me. Simply command me and I shall leave at once, Doryodhan slapped his friend on the back in delight. I am blessed because you have favored me, O hero. What more could I want than to see your mighty self-interest in my welfare? Surely my life has borne fruit today. Go out, dear friend, and vanquish my foes. May good come to you. Just ask and I shall do whatever I can to help. Karna at once began to make arrangements for his expedition. Doryodhan amassed a vast army with a year's supplies. After consulting with Brahmins and gaining Dhritarashtra's permission, he selected a favorable day to depart Bhishma and Vidura, however, did not approve of Karna's plan, but they chose to remain silent. Perhaps the fool would be defeated somewhere and his pride would be curbed. At least while he was gone, he would not be influencing Duryodhan toward yet another rash scheme. Blessed by the court Brahmins, who uttered prayers for his victory, Karna went out of the city followed by thousands of troops. He first attacked King Drupada's beautiful city. Drupada did not pay allegiance to the Kauravas. Like many of the kings who he had accepted Yudhishthira's role, Drupada was not inclined toward Dhritarashtra. In the end, however, Drupada was overpowered by the superior force brought from Hastinapura and obliged to offer Dhritarashtra tribute Karna and move north, subjugating all the kings in that region. He vanquished Bhagavadatta as well as all the Himaluyan mountain kings. Traveling east, he overcame many tribes. None were able to defeat him in battle as he rained down fierce arrows. Soraya's son was a perilous fighter whom few on earth could face, especially when he was joined by the Karu army. He soon defeated all the kings in the south and made his way west, conquering and subjugating all in his path. Well within a year Karna had accumulated a huge amount of wealth from his conquests. He carried it back to Hastinapura in a long line of chariots and oxen. Doryodhan and his father and brothers greeted him as he entered the city. They congratulated Karna and embraced him. Doryodhan said, What I have not received even from Bhishma, Drona, Kripa, or any other, I have received from Karna. O oh mighty armed hero, in you I have my protector. All the Pandavas and other kings are nothing compared to you. 
Seeing Karna successful, some of the citizens were pleased while others, favorable to the Pandavas, lamented or remained silent. Dhritarashtra was overjoyed and embraced Karna with affection, considering him his own son. From that day on, Doryodhan, seeing Karna's prowess, considered the Pandavas defeated. The prince was encouraged and began to think about performing the Rajasuya sacrifice. Now that the world had been brought under his control, he wanted to equal the Pandavas in every way. If he could preside over the Rajasuya, then all his desires would be fulfilled. But when the prince approached his chief priest and requested him to perform the sacrifice, he was told it was not possible. As long as Yudhishthira lives, the priest said, no man on earth can perform the Rajasuya. It is only possible for one monarch to perform that sacrifice at any one time. Nor can a man perform the sacrifice in his father's presence. Then the priest explained that there was another sacrifice, resembling the Rajasriya, which Doryodhan could perform. It was called the Vaishnava sacrifice. No person other than the immortal Vishnu had ever performed it, and it was equal to the Rajasuya in every way. O king, using the gold offered as tribute by the kings of the world, make a golden plow. With this plow you should prepare the ground, and upon that spot I shall begin the sacrifice. Doryodhan immediately discussed the sacrifice with his father and counselors, who all expressed approval. He then appointed people to the various posts required for the sacrifice and instructed artisans to make a golden plow. All the Karu elders were delighted to see Doryodhan performing a sacrifice, an act which they hoped would increase his piety and the glory of the Karu race. Swift messengers were dispatched to invite the kings of the world. Dushashana asked messengers to go to the Dwight of Anna and invite the Pandavas so they could see the Koru's power. When Yudhishthira heard the invitation he replied, It is indeed fortunate that Doryodhan is perfuming such a great sacrifice. I should very much like to attend, but it will not be possible. I cannot leave the forest until my vow is completed. Doryodhan will see me in Hastinapura only when the thirteen years of exile are over. Bhima, however, glared at the messenger. King Yudhishthira will go when we are ready to put Doryodhan into the fire kindled by weapons. Repeat this message to Doryodhan, when thirteen years are complete, Dharmaraja, the lord of men, in the sacrifice of battle, will pour onto the sons of Dhritarashtra the ghee of his anger that is when we shall come, the other brothers said nothing. When Doryodhan heard the messages, he simply smiled. Thousands of Brahmins and Kshatriyas arrived in Hastinapura. They were warmly greeted and offered food and drink and appropriate accommodation. Vidura took charge of receiving the guests, ensuring that they were satisfied in every way. Once they had been properly refreshed, he showed them to the sacrificial compound outside the city. The visiting kings brought tribute and Doryodhan and his brothers offered the Brahmins charity. At the end of the sacrifice, Doryodhan re-entered his city surrounded by his brothers and eulogized by bards and singers. His friends and relatives glorified him, saying that this sacrifice had surpassed all those performed by his ancestors, all of whom had gone to heaven. However, some fearless citizens said that the sacrifice did not compare with Yudhishthira's Rajasuya. Although Doryodhan heard what was being said, he did not respond. He knew it was true. The Rajasuya had been the most opulent and splendid ceremony he had ever witnessed. His had come nowhere near its magnificence. Karna saw his friend becoming pensive. Placing his arm around the prince, he said, O foremost of the Bharatas, by good fortune your sacrifice has been successful. This is only the beginning. When the Pandavas are slain in battle, you will then complete the Rajasuya. I look forward to again glorifying you at that time. Doryodhan embraced Karna and thought of the Rajasuya. O Korus, he said, when shall I celebrate that best of sacrifices? The Rajasriya, after killing the wicked-minded Pandavas, Karna stopped walking and spoke gravely. Hear my words, O king. As long as I have not killed Arjuna, I will not taste meat or accept luxuries. I will give to anyone anything they ask of me. When asked for something in charity, I will never say, I cannot give it. Dhritarashtra's sons cheered to hear Karna's vow. They considered the Pandavas already slain. As the handsome Karna strode powerfully into his palace, even as Kuvera enters his abode, the Kauravas all praised him. The Pandavas also heard about Karna's vow. Bhima and Arjuna sneered, but Yudhishthira was alarmed. Thinking of Karna's impenetrable natural armor, 
he knew Karna could not be slain yet he Shpira brooded on the situation. He had brought on all their hardships and dangers. Out of their devotion for him his brothers now accepted miseries they did not deserve. Soon they would face great danger in the battle with the Karu heroes, who would be assisted by Karna and the other powerful warriors Yudhishthira fell into anxiety day and night. Remembering the gambling match and the harsh words of Karna and Duryodhan, he felt as if his heart had been pierced by a lance. His brothers and Draupadi, seeing his condition, also felt pained. Enraged at the Kauravas, they longed for the time when they could at last confront them in battle. Each day the brothers practiced rigorous physical exercises, keeping themselves fit for fighting and giving vent to their wrath. In the final months of their stay in the forest, Vyasadevagan came to see them. Yudhishthira worshipped him with devotion and then sat before him to hear his words. Seeing the Pandavas lean and anxious, the sage was moved to compassion. In a voice choked with tears he said, O foremost of men, no man can ever experience unmixed happiness. Everyone experiences happiness and distress in due course. A wise man therefore becomes neither joyful or grief-stricken. He does not indulge in happiness or give way to sorrow when each arrive. Rather, he practices asceticism to attain the eternal happiness born of spiritual realization. From asceticism comes the greatest happiness, not from improving our material circumstances. Foolish persons, seeking material enjoyments by any means, obtain births as beasts in their next lives. They never enjoy happiness. O King, your practice of asceticism, although difficult, will lead to your ultimate welfare, after describing the many qualities a man would develop from asceticism, truthfulness, freedom from anger, self-control, non violentia Vyasadev went on to speak of charity, which Yudhishthira always practice when he had wealth. When Vyasadev fell silent, Yudhishthira asked, O great Rishi, which is better, asceticism or charity? Which produces a better result and which is more difficult to practice? Vyasadev replied, O child, there is nothing more difficult to practice than charity. Men thirst for wealth and obtain it only after great effort. Risking their lives, they enter the depths of the sea and the forest in their search of wealth. There is nothing they will not do to become rich. Therefore, it is extremely difficult to part with hard-earned wealth. But, O oh hero, properly earned wealth should be given away with an open heart to worthy persons. Ill-gotten wealth, however, even if given away, will not free its owner from degradation in the next life, Yudhishthira asked Vyasadev to speak more about the benefits of giving charity and the sage told him an old history. There had been a poor man named Mujla who had attained the supreme spiritual abode simply by his practice of giving charity to Brahmins. The Pandavas were fascinated. Finally the sage said, O son of Kunti, do not grieve. Happiness and distress revolve around a man one after the other as if on a wheel. You will surely recover your father's kingdom at the end of your exile. By your asceticism and charity you will attain all auspiciousness. Be at peace. I am going. The Pandavas offered their obeisances as the Rishi rose to leave and fell comforted by his words. Doryodhan thought continuously of ways by which he might harm the Pandavas. He consulted with his brothers and Karna, trying to devise a means to overcome the brothers before they returned from the forest. While he was considering different plans, the ascetic Dorvasa happened to visit the city. He had with him ten thousand disciples and he came to the royal palace asking for food for all of them. The sage was famous for his anger, if he were not served properly, he would quickly curse the offender. He would also test his hosts to the limits of their patience, wanting to see if they adhered to their religious obligations under all circumstances. Fearing that his curse would be brought upon them by some incompetent serpent, Doryodhan served Dorvasa personally. With all the humility and gentleness he could muster, he carefully ministered to the sages every request, acting just like a menial servant Dorvasa was unpredictable. Sometimes he would demand that a meal be prepared immediately, but when it was fetched he would go away to bathe. He would then return after a long time and say, I will not eat now. I am no longer hungry. He would rise at midnight and call for food and other attentions, often criticizing the food and service he received or Yodun served him without complaint and remained attentive to the Rishi's every wish Dorvasa was pleased with the prince. Just before leaving he said, You have served me well. I will grant you a boon. Ask from me whatever you desire. 
If it is not opposed to religion, I will satisfy you at once, Doryodhan felt as if he had received new life. He had already conferred with his counselors as to what boon he should request if Dorvasa should ask him. Thus he replied, O Brahman, just as you have been my guest, so you become the guest of Yudhishthira in the forest. He is accomplished and well behaved and he is a great king, the best and eldest of our family. He therefore deserves to receive your blessings. You should go to him when his entire family has finished eating and are preparing to rest. You will then be well received by those pious men, Dorvasor replied, I will do as you ask. He then left with his disciples, heading for the camp. Yakador Yodun punched the air in joy. The Pandavas would never be able to receive Dorvasa and his many disciples properly after Draupadi had eaten. They would have no way to feed 10,000 Brahmins without the magic plate they had received from Soraya. Surely they would be cursed by Dorvasa, and Arishi's curse could never fail Doryodhan ran to his friends. Our plan has succeeded, he cried. The Pandavas are doomed, he embraced Karna, who said, By good fortune you have fared well and fulfilled your desire. By good fortune your enemies are cast into an ocean of misery, difficult to cross. Through their own fault they now face great danger, laughing and clasping each other's hands. Doryodhan and his counselors rejoiced some days later, Dorvasa arrived at the Pandava camp just after Draupadi had eaten. Leaving his disciples on the outskirts of the camp, he walked in alone and appeared before the brothers. They all immediately stood with joined palms. Seeing the famous Rishi standing before them, they fell to the ground in respectful obeisance Yudhishthira offered Dorvasa an excellent seat and worshipped him with all attention Dorvasa then said, I am here with my ten thousand disciples and we need to eat. We have been walking all day and are hungry. O king, please arrange for our food. We shall first take our bath and then return for the meal, Yudhishthira said, so be it, and Dorvasa left for the river with his disciples. After he had gone, Yudhishthira expressed his alarm. How could he possibly feed that many people Draupadi had already eaten and the mystical plate would not yield more until morning Yudhishthira asked his wife if she could do anything Draupadi, who always thought of her husband's welfare, began to contemplate the problem. Her only hope was prayer. The princess thought of Krishna and prayed, O Krishna, Lord of the Universe, O destroyer of your devotees' difficulties, O unlimited and all-powerful one, please hear my prayer. You are the refuge of the helpless, the giver of endless boons to all beings, the unknowable and all-knowing supreme person. Kindly protect me. I seek your shelter. O Lord, as you formerly saved me from Dushashana in the assembly, so please save me now from this difficulty. Krishna was in his palace at that time, lying on his bed with Rukmani. That mysterious person, whose movements are unknown to all, heard Draupadi's prayers. He immediately rose from his bed and, leaving his wife, ran from the palace. Within a few moments he was standing before Draupadi, who fell at his feet with tears in her eyes. O oh Krishna, we face a great danger from Dorvasa's curse. What can be done? Krishna smiled. I will do whatever can be done, but I too am hungry. Please feed me first and after that I shall do whatever is required, ashamed, Draupadi replied, My lord, the vessel given by the sun remains full until I have eaten. I recently took my meal and now it will not give more food, this is no time for joking, said Krishna. Quickly fetch the vessel and show me, Draupadi brought the dish before Krishna and he examined it closely. In one corner he found a particle of rice and vegetables stuck together, and he ate it at once, saying, May Lord Hari, the soul of the universe, be satisfied with this food and may the Lord of all sacrifices be pleased. Krishna then turned to say Hadev and said, Go quickly and bring the ascetics here and feed them. The Pandavas looked around fearfully. There was no sign of food. But they had faith that Krishna would not let them down say Hadev left for the river to find Dorvasa and his disciples. At the river the innocent Dorvasa was expecting Yudhishthira to have prepared a meal for him and all his followers, but suddenly he felt as if he had just consumed a large meal. He looked at his disciples. They too appeared full and were rubbing their stomachs and belching. Looking at each other, the ascetics realized that none of them felt like eating at all. Dorvasa said to his disciples, We have uselessly made Yudhishthira prepare a meal for ten thousand men and done him a great wrong. Will not the Pandavas destroy us by looking upon us with angry eyes? O oh, Brahmins, I know Yudhishthira to be possessed of great powers. He is devoted to the feet of Lord Hari and I fear such men. 
They can consume us with their anger as fire can consume a bale of cotton. Let us therefore depart quickly from this place before they see us again. Although he was a powerful mystic yogi, Dorvasa knew that his power was nothing compared to that of those devoted to the Supreme Lord. He recalled a previous incident when he had upset another devotee of the Lord. At that time he had been placed in great difficulty and had almost lost his life. Without another word Dorvasa came out of the river and walked swiftly away from the pond of Uz camp. His disciples fled away in all directions, keeping well clear of the pond of Uz. When Sayadev arrived at the river he found no one there. A few water pots and pieces of cloth were lying around, but there was no sign of the ascetics. He searched around and came across other Brahmins who informed him that Dorvasa and his followers had left suddenly Sayadev went back to his brothers and gave them his report Yudhishthira was worried. The ascetics will come back in the dead of night and demand their meal, he said fearfully. How can we escape from this great danger created by destiny Krishna smiled. O oh, Yudhishthira, you need not fear Dorvasa and his disciples have fled, afraid of your ascetic power. Those who are always virtuous need never fear danger. With your permission I shall now return to my home, Yudhishthira replied, O oh Krishna, as persons drowning in a vast ocean are saved by a boat, so we have been saved by you. Be pleased to go now as you desire, Krishna left in the Pandavas surrounded their chaste wife, thanking her for her presence of mind and praying to Krishna. They discussed the incident among themselves. The incident seemed to have been arranged by the core of us. Fortunately, Krishna was always there to save them no matter what danger they faced. Thinking of their friend from Dwarakot, the brothers entered their thatched cottages and rested for the night.